Well, this is another quick video on some of the recent travels I've been able to do with the uh, airplane. Recently, we went up to Salt Lake City with the family and did a little bit of skiing. We had to dodge a little bit of thunderstorms on the way out of town. And once we got past that, with the help of ATC and, and the radar on board and XM and ADSB weather, we uh, got some great views of the mountains. Uh, we had to get through um, one squall line or get around it rather and then past some of the clouds but as we got close to Salt Lake City we could finally start taking in the beautiful scenery. This is probably one of the longer flights time-wise that, um, that I've done at least at normal cruise power and uh, going from Austin, Texas up to Salt Lake usually with a little bit of wind against you, uh, gets pretty close to the max endurance of the airplane. You could probably go a little further, but uh, not a whole lot. And if the weather was suspect and you might have to go to your alternate, you wouldn't have any good reserve much past going to Salt Lake. Here we are driving over to Park City for our actual skiing time. We were staying with some friends over there and going to Deer Valley. Ended up being great for skiing. It was very cold, uh, around 10 degrees Fahrenheit, but uh, good snow and a fair bit of sun, so it was nice. We ended up meeting a fair number of people from either Texas or California that had come out here for skiing, so it seems to be a popular destination. And then we stayed over for New Year's, watched the ball drop, and went back out to the plane to head home. Thankfully, they had put it in the hangar overnight. If they had not, it would have been too cold to start it without the GPU or ground power unit. And uh, they said that they could not unplug it after engine start because the plug for the GPU is too close to the moving prop. So I would have had to leave my wife um, in the cockpit holding the brakes and making sure the aircraft didn't move while I myself went out with the door open and unplugged it. It would have been a little awkward. But because it was in the hangar, it was plenty warm and it started right up. The battery was happy and it was great. We got right out of there. And so leaving Salt Lake, we were going to South Carolina for the next leg of our Christmas trip, New Year's trip, and uh, that was the longest flight by distance that I've ever done. So we could not make it at normal cruise. So instead what I did was pull the power back, not all the way to long range cruise, because that'd be pretty slow, but kind of in between. And then we watched the fuel over destination readout as we got going. That value started at negative 480 gallons uh, when we were climbing out, which is normal. It's going to be very low during that phase of flight, um, but that was the lowest I've ever seen. And that was basically telling us that when we got to our destination, we would have run out of gas 480 gallons before, uh, which was obviously ridiculous, but we kept watching it. Here it's 376. You know, once we got to cruise, we could start really paying attention to what the value looked like. Now, we had a headwind until we got to Denver, and this was all known in advance through the forecast. We were using the four-flight uh, flight plan. We could see all that, so we anticipated that as we got closer, instead of that 91-knot headwind, we would uh, have something like a 50-knot tailwind for the bulk of the, of the trip. And by the time we were around Denver, we started to seeing a positive 21 gallons of fuel over destination. So it was starting to look good. Again, I had the power kind of in between the long range cruise, which is a slower cruise speed and um, the higher max or normal cruise level. So uh, our cheer speed was around 270, 275 instead of say 310 like we normally do. So the trip ended up being over five hours long. I think it was five hours, 15 minutes or so. But by the time we got close to our destination, our fuel uh, value was scheduled to be around 60 gallons at landing, which is pretty close to my personal minimums of acceptable. Um, that gives me a little bit of leeway if we you know, got down there and found a deer on the runway. Um, if we knew the weather was bad and we would have to go to the alternate, that would be beyond my personal minimums and we'd, we would have just simply stopped for fuel. We had a few ideas of where to go for that. Places we could get a quick lunch and some cheap gas. 
And then a few days later, we had our trip home, and that was uh, just typical flight, nothing much to look at there. But uh, about a week later, I had a great trip that was scheduled out to the Bahamas. For this trip, we took the Citation Mustang to Nassau. We started in Houston and did a uh, stop for fuel on the way in Florida, and then uh, hopped on over. And I got to fly one of the legs going out, and one of them coming back. So this was a fishing trip, and the way it works is we would land ourselves in Nassau and then get a car over to hop into a turbine otter that had been converted a few years ago and use that to hop over to Flamingo Key, where the small resort is. They can handle maybe 6 to 12 guests at a time. When we went to put our headsets on, we even found a stowaway that we wanted to go fishing with us. So here we are on final approach to their uh, homemade airstrip. Everything out here they had to build up themselves. They had to bring barges of materials to make these uh, houses and the kitchen area and the little fire pit and there's the skeet range out there. Everything had to be built and um, it's a large island. It's part of Andros but uh, this area that they're in is basically just them and nobody around. So it was an impressive feat for a small family to have done. Right when we got off the otter, they took our bags and greeted us with rum drinks, which was an awesome way to start the trip. Then we got settled into our accommodations and just took a look around, got acclimated to where we were. A few of our guys had brought some drones, some of the newer DJI drones, so we uh, had a good time playing with some of that the first evening as well and just getting used to how those new ones fly and operate. This is some of the first footage we took with the Mavic 2. And we were really impressed with this drone as we used it more. Uh, you could set it to a mode where you can do basically 40 miles per hour, or you can have it scale down to where your inputs on the joystick are really fluid, making for really good filming. So this is his hangar. There's the Twin Otter. Beside it is the uh, A-Star that one of the owners also flies. And there's the accommodations out there, some water treatment. You see this uh, kind of white road coming in with the pavers into the fenced area. They've got volleyball and all kinds of activities here. And actually, you can see us down there on the porch. That's where we were flying from. And that creek there gets them out to the uh, big water. This is a, another angle in that same creek, and the house in the distance is that same house. So they've got various docks. Um, off there in the distance and here I was just trying to follow this bird and see how well I could do that with the Mavic. We were shocked at how good the range is for how far it can stream video back to your iPhone. It was incredible. Theoretically the thing can fly five miles away. We tried, we got about three, three and a half away before the battery gave out, but the signal was still, it was still really good. Uh, we got a great line of sight in this place because everything's very flat. So it's a good place to test it. So they just need bigger batteries in order to achieve that five mile range. It was tricky landing it because it has some obstacle avoidance stuff. And so it was getting pretty upset when we tried to bring it in to the porch to, to land it, but we figured it out. So here we are the next morning on that same creek, tearing out in one of these flat bottom boats to go do a little bit of fishing. The uh, bonefish is the popular fish out here, 
and they're pretty abundant. It's kind of a catch and release. And in fact, you try not to even touch them. You uh, just get them hooked, bring them close to the boat, and use a little tool to get them unhooked and let them go again. And they said maybe 50%, maybe a little better of those uh, that are caught like that do survive and go on to keep the population going. And since me and one of the other guys, who's a buddy of mine, are not big fishermen, we couldn't resist making use of the drone a bit. So we got some really cool footage here and there as we were out and about. We played around a fair bit with the Mavic's follow me mode, which really seems more geared towards following a person that's kind of walking around or running around, but it would generally follow the boat pretty well. If some of the trees got in the way, it could get a little confused. Uh, but it was pretty impressive what it could do. It's also got a really good optical zoom on it, which we found handy because instead of trying to fly in way too tight and get uncomfortable with where the drone was, we could just zoom in and still get a cool shot. This was my first time fly fishing, and so um, it was interesting to figure out how this worked. Basically, two two of us went out with one guide, and the guide's in the back. You know, he's in this shot, obviously driving the boat and figuring out where he wants to take us. But he would take us to some shallow spots, and then he would hop up on an elevated platform on the back and use a giant pole to push us around through the mud to uh, get where the schools of fish were and try to angle us and position us as we stood off the front on the bow to uh, use the, the fly rod and get the uh, fly right in front of the bonefish. Usually it was a school of maybe 10 of them at a time. And you'd drop the fly down right in front of them, not too close because you could spook them, but not too far away because they need to see it. Let the fly settle. And the fly is meant to look like a little shrimp on the bottom, which they love to eat. So you would strip the line or pull the line just a little bit, maybe a few inches at a time, to try to look like a shrimp popping. And the water's so clear, you can see exactly what the fish are doing the whole time. And by the time we had done this for a couple of days, I was getting really good at picking what was a bonefish versus a barracuda versus a shark. We even saw some stingrays out there. Um, but you can see what they're doing, and if they're attracted to the fly, you'll see them kind of turn and start chasing it. And then once they suck it in, you do a big strip, big pull, and try to set the hook. And at that point, uh, you're just letting them take out the line and run with it a little bit and trying to keep it all tight so the hook stays set. And as they relax, you start reeling them in to the boat. Yeah, once it gets close enough, the guide will pull it over, and he's got a little sort of hook removal tool that he can reach down. You can see it, just a little piece of metal. And get that hook out, and let the fish go. This one was worn out, but uh, after pushing it around a little bit and making some noise, it took off. Seemed like maybe it was going to do okay. They go kind of dormant. You wore them out, yeah, man. Look at that. Dude, that was awesome. Perfect. Perfect. And when it was my turn to fish up front, which we would swap out quite often, I came up with every possible way of screwing it up. But so at the very end, I finally did catch one after the guide had put me into perfect position on about a hundred fish before this. And so here's the one catch that I made. There you go. Now just swing your rod tip over to me. And I'll grab him. Nice. Oh yeah, no, I got you. So of course when we saw that A star when we had first come in here, we knew we had to figure out how to get a ride out of him. And uh, the owner's super generous and he needed to go fly for a little bit anyway. So he was kind enough to take us along on a little sightseeing trip from this side of Andros to the other side and uh, gave us a little surprise towards the end.
I thought it was interesting. He had a battery module that he could plug into the GPU and he used that to start not only the A-Star but uh, also the Amphibious Otter. I guess to save the ship's power. And this was the surprise he saved for the end of our tour. They had actually bought a ship, a quite large ship recently, and have outfitted it to be a future lodge where they'll have uh, high-end accommodations for a small group to come out. They'll be just based on the boat, anchored out in the water, and use the smaller boats to come and go to do more fishing. So they're expanding their operation. And later that evening, when everybody was done with their fishing or other activities, he took us out on a medium-sized boat out to go see the boat in person and get on it and enjoy it for a little bit for sunset. Along the way, we made good use of the drone, got some footage of him coming out of the creek. And this seemed like the boat was about to hit the sides at any moment. But he's a great pilot, not only of uh, fixed wings and rotorcraft, but also watercraft. We tried more of the follow me mode with the Mavic and it was working really well, but we were uh, boating into a headwind. And so the quadcopter was kicked over literally about 45 degree pitch into the wind trying to keep up with us. We were doing maybe 30 miles per hour and it, it did a great job, but uh, the battery wore out before too long. We had to land it on the boat. It was only about a 15 minute ride out to the ship. So uh, once we got there, we were able to explore it and take a look at all the rooms, the accommodations, the, the kitchen or the galley setup was impressive. And here's the command center, which I couldn't help but take in all the avionics and radios and cool equipment they had up there. But it didn't take us too long before we found our way to the top of the ship where the best views were. And we grabbed some beers and some snacks and relaxed and enjoyed the sunset. Then all too soon, our trip was over. On the last day, there was a thunderstorm forecast before uh, we were trying to go, so we ended up leaving about two hours early, and the winds had already come in. It was probably 25 knots, but thankfully for our takeoff here, it was basically a direct headwind, so that it helped the otter get off the ground that much sooner. And then here's our landing back on that very same lake we started from on Nassau. So by the time we got over to the International Airport where our Mustang was, the storm had rolled in. So we ended up waiting 30 or 40 minutes to let it go by, and then we hopped in while it was still raining but on the tail end of the storm to work our way back home. We ended up stopping in Fort Lauderdale for customs. That was a great experience. We used the Banyan FBO there. It was really cool, really easy. And then we stopped not far from New Orleans to uh, get some cheap fuel before I did the last leg for us at night into uh, Houston Hobby. That last leg was a great experience for me because I've only got maybe 20 hours in the Mustang and it was finally a flight where it was perfectly still outside and I could really try to learn how the aircraft likes to fly, how the engine reacts and so forth with power changes. And I got really comfortable by the time we came down for, for touchdown. It was a great flight. 
So that's it for now. If you made it this far in the video, thanks. I know this was a longer one, but uh, had a lot of interesting stuff, or at least I thought so. I'll see you on the next one.